Hi everyone, this is Mike Lewandowski coming to you today with another Bible study on Ezekiel. Uh, let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, so... Today, we're going to cover Ezekiel chapters 25 through 29. And previously with Ezekiel, we talked about um, this coming disaster, this, this destruction that's coming upon Jerusalem. But now we're going to turn our attention, or I should say Ezekiel's going to turn our attention to um, the judgment of the other nations in and around Judah. Okay, and this is going to lead right up to, uh, we, um, it won't be in this video, but um, in the next one, it will lead right up to what is called the Restoration Oracles, as uh, commentators have given it, where um, we talk about uh, Israel being restored and a number of Messianic prophecies. So it'll be fascinating. But today we're going to focus a little bit on the other nations and what, how is God dealing with them, okay? So it's very interesting. So if we begin in 25, and we read, it's called the prophecy against the Ammonites. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Say to the Ammonites, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, because you said, aha, over my sanctuary when it was profaned, and over the land of Israel when it was made desolate, and over the house of Judah when it went into exile. Therefore, I am handing you over to the people of the east for a possession, and they shall set their encampments among you and make their dwellings in your midst. They shall eat your fruit and they shall drink your milk. I will make Rabbah, that's one of their main cities, a pasture for camels and the cities of the Ammonites a fold for flocks. Then you will know that I am the Lord, for thus says the Lord God, because you have clapped your hands and stamped your feet and rejoiced with all the malice within you against the land of Israel. Therefore, behold, I have stretched out my hand against you and I and will hand you over as spoil to the nations and I will cut off from the people, uh, cut you off from the people and will make you perish out of the countries. I will destroy you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Okay. So, um, so we begin with the Ammonites. Okay. And what comes out, as the text reveals, as our commentator uh, or our commentary by Dr. David Block reveals, is that the Ammonites, one of the closest groups to Jerusalem, they gloated over the destruction of the city. The the uh, they gloated over um, how the temple was uh, profaned. Okay, and it's it's interesting because you see that. Even though God is punishing his people, which he has every right to do, they have violated the covenant, they have sinned against him. However, he will not tolerate other nations gloating over um, her destruction. He will not tolerate them taking pleasure in her demise. And so judgment will fall upon these nations as well. Okay, so this is very important. And we don't have to go through every single nation. But one of the things he does is after talking about the Ammonites, he talks about Moab. And um, uh, the, it says about Moab in verses um, 8 through 11 that they simply uh, believed uh, that Israel was just another nation, that they weren't special. See, look at they were destroyed. Um, he mentions others. Uh, like the Philistines, like Edom. And you see the fact that all these different nations in some way or another um, took pleasure or were happy over the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay? And so this really, uh, this brought down God's judgment upon them. Okay? And so it, it would be like... 
you know, if, you know, my kids are really little, but what if they were older and, you know, uh, let's say they were, uh, one of my sons was a teenager and they got busted for drinking and driving, um, so, you know, something to that effect. You know, obviously I'd be furious, I'd be so angry, okay? But I would not want other people gloating over that. I would not want people saying, oh, well, you know, look at Mike works for the church and look at, look at what his son did. You know, um, I, I, of course, that, that, would, that would make me angry. Now, I couldn't execute judgment on them. I'm not God. But th it's kind of a similar situation. It's kind of like, okay, God's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't you dare take pleasure in their destruction. And granted, for some of these, it's not entirely clear um, what they did, but it seems like there there was there was this this pleasure in Israel's demise. So he just mentions very quickly, Ezekiel mentions a number of these nations. Then in chapter 26 he gets to Tyre. And then here's where he spends a lot of time. He's going to spend a lot of time on Tyre, and he's going to spend a lot of time on Egypt. Okay. Uh, and, and and there's there's great reasons for this. But let's let's just begin by reading a little bit about Tyre. So 26, in the 11th year, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. So just so we know, um, according to our commentary, this most likely is coming, this uh, oracle, this prophecy, is coming, on Feb in, coming in February of 585. So this is after um, the destruction of Jerusalem. Son of man, because Tyre said concerning Jerusalem, Aha! See, notice the gloating. The gate of the peoples is broken. It is. It has swung open to me. I shall be replenished now that she is laid waste. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers, and I will scrape her soil from her and make her bare rock. She shall be in the midst of the sea, a place for the spreading of nets. For I have spoken, says the Lord God, and she shall become a spoil to the nations. And her daughters on the mainland shall be slain by the sword. Then they will know then that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring, up Ty I will bring upon Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses and chariots and with horsemen and a host of many soldiers." He will slay with the sword your daughters on the mainland. He will set up a siege wall against you and throw up a mound against you and raise a roof of shields against you. He will direct the shock of his battery rams against your walls and with his axes he will break down your towers. So I'm going to stop there after the first ten verses. Okay, so as we can guess, Tyre will come under God's judgment. Okay, and um, they were, the leadership was overjoyed at Jerusalem's demise. And one of the reasons is when I was when I was research, researching this in the commentary is okay, so Tyre was known for its trading. Okay? And one of their main competitors was Jerusalem. So they looked at this uh, among other things as, a, as an economic opportunity. Oh my goodness, one of our biggest competitors has just been wiped out. How much, you know, richer will that make our nation? Okay, so this is, they're, they're taking pleasure in this. They're seeing how the demise of the Jewish people is going to ultimately enrich them. Now, because of this, God says that many nations will go up uh, and attack you. And, and as Black points out, when he talks about the, the daughters being slain on the mainland, those are the towns that were on the coast. The actual... Um, the, the main area tire was on an island. Okay, so it was it was um, it was on an island with yes some towns, and you know maybe what we would call today suburbs, on the mainland. Okay, so Tyre was very protected city. It was known for its wealth, and numerous items of trade went in and out of the city. So Tyre was was a very strong economic. Um, and military power of that time, okay? Now, God says, though, that Babylon will attack Tyre. 
and he'll destroy the towns on the mainland and he'll lay siege to the city. And again, when we talk about a siege, what they would do is they would build up, um, you know, mounds, uh, trenches, you know, the soldiers would surround the city and just kind of starve it, cut it off until either the people surrendered or they could just bust through the walls. Um, and according to this prophecy, the chariots will break through into the city and death will ensue. And then the enemy, of course, will plunder the city. They'll take the spoil. So this is what Ezekiel says um, is the fate of Tyre. Now we continue um, um, in verse 12. They will make a spoil of your riches and prey upon your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses, your stones and timbers and soil. And they will cast into the midst of the waters. And I will stop the music of your songs and the sound of your lyres shall be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock. You shall be a place for the spreading of nets. Those are fish nets, like where they would dry out the nets. Um, and, you shall, um, and you shall never be rebuilt. For I, the Lord, have spoken, says the Lord God. So he goes on talking about the plundering of the city. And then he talks about how the princes of Tyre will have to step down from their thrones. They'll have to take off their robes. They're, they're, they're symbols of authority. And um, a song of lamentation and grief will go up um, in the city. So Ezekiel, again, is talking about this coming devastation. Um, this coming devastation to the people of this land. And in 27 chapter 27 of Ezekiel, the word of the Lord came to me. Now you son of man, raise a lamentation over Tyre and say to Tyre who dwells at the entrance to the sea, merchant of the peoples on many islands, thus says the Lord God. So the merchant of the sea. O Tyre, um, you, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Your borders are, are in the heart of the seas. Your builders made perfect your beauty. They made you all planks of fir trees from Senor. They took a cedar from Lebanon to make a mass for you. So he goes on and on. He, he's describing, according to Black Tyre, as this, uh, this mighty ship, this, this beautiful, powerful ship, you know, in the midst of the seas. And then he goes on, beginning in chapter 10, and going through... Um, the succeeding verses, naming all the different nations that traded with Tyre, all the merchandise that went in and out of the city. You know, he even says in verse 17, Judah in the land of Israel traded with you. They exchanged for your merchandise wheat, olives, and early figs, honey, oil, and balm. So you see the wealth, all the business that is going in and out of this city. Okay. And... Of course, this, this, this image is, is one of wealth, is one of power. However, Ezekiel says that uh, when we continue reading on in 27, that this wealth in this beauty will end. And he describes Tyre as being shipwrecked. That all this glory, all this might, all this you know, seemingly endless power and prestige that you have will ultimately come to an end end. Okay, so that's what 27 is. We don't have to go through every verse. It's just talking about the, again, the glory of Tyre and its destruction. Now, 28, chapter 28 of Ezekiel gets into Tyre again. And it's, uh, I'm just going to read the first 10 verses. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is proud, and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seats of gods, in the heart of the seas. Yet you are but a man and no God, though you consider yourself as, a, as wise as a God. You, indeed, you are indeed wiser than Daniel. No secret is hidden from you. By your wisdom and your understanding, you have gotten wealth for yourself and have gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your wealth. And your heart has become proud in your wealth. Okay. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you consider yourself as wise as a God, 
Therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you, the most terrible of nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall thrust you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain um, in the heart of the seas. Um, um, will you still say I am a god in the presence of those uh, who slay you, though you are but a man and no god? In the hands of those who wound you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of foreigners, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. Okay, so, um, again, you see this prince, this leader of Tyre, the pride, the arrogance, declaring himself to be a god. And as, as Ezekiel says, inspired by the Holy Spirit, you are no god. Will you say you're a god? when they're destroying your city, when they're destroying the land, when, when your life is about to end, will you declare yourself then to be a god? So you see, this arrogance, that pride will fall, just like it's Satan in his pride fell. And, and you know, one of the things Christ, of course, um, emphasizes throughout his ministry is humility is to have not to be prideful, but to realize everything is a gift from God. And it's not because of our own doing or greatness, but everything is a gift from God. And this is why Mary, especially the Virgin Mary is especially uh, just a model of humility. Be it done unto me according to thy word. But you see the arrogance of the proud will always lead to a fall. And how many political figures in our own day, in our own time, have fallen? you know, full of arrogance and pride. And then they are basically forgotten. They have fallen off of the pages of history. Okay, so there, there, there is definitely, in scriptures, always, always making this correlation between pride and the person ultimately falling. Okay, so we, you know, again, we could draw this, we could connect this with our own life. Okay, now, um, in verse 11, he says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. He goes on to name a number of precious stones. But then he says, "Your heart," in verse 17, Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground, I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. By the multitude of your inequities, in the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. So I brought forth fire from the midst of you, it consumed you. And I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have, uh, you have come to a dreadful end. And shall, uh, and shall be no more forever. So again, the, the destruction, the king who was like an e in uh, Eden, was like a garden in Eden, who had all this wisdom, had all this beauty, had all these gifts, but yet became proud, and it was his pride that brought him down. Okay, just an historical fact I was reading from Block, and I thought this was really interesting. This is kind of the one prophecy in Ezekiel that doesn't necessarily come to fruition. Okay, yes, Babylon did attack Tyre. Yes, they did uh, form siege works around it. But Tyre was ultimately not defeated by Babylon. Okay, um, they would eventually be defeated by Alexander the Great. That's when they would disappear. So Ezekiel will actually even bring this up, why this took place. But it is kind of interesting. So, I mean, all this, I mean, Babylon did attack them, the siege works, everything like that. It just ultimately Tyre was not destroyed here. So I did want to bring that up, and I found that interesting. And it's not just something like that is glossed over, because Ezekiel talks about it as well, and how Nebuchadnezzar would then turn his sights on um, Egypt. Okay. And just uh, in verses 20 um, through 24, um, he talks about also the prophecy against uh, Sidon and how the Lord's judgment will come upon them. But in verse 25, he says this, For uh, thus says the Lord God, When I gathered the house of Israel, 
from the peoples among whom they are scattered and manifest my holiness in them in the sight of the nations. Then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob. And they shall dwell securely in it. And they shall build houses and plant vineyards. They shall dwell securely when I execute judgment upon all their neighbors who have treated them with contempt. Then they will know that I am the Lord God. Okay, so what happens here? God promises that Israel will be destroyed. He says they are scattered among the nations, but a restoration is coming. So amid all these prophecies of doom and gloom and destruction, again, there's God using Ezekiel is still breathing hope into the people that there will be a restoration. Okay? And again, they will again build houses, they'll plant vineyards. Anytime you see like vineyards being planted, um, Vineyards of, uh, required um, a number of years to mature, to bear fruit. So it was a time of security. So this time of restoration and security is coming to the land. Okay, so he kind of gets that in there amid all this judgment. Now, and this is where we'll end. I mean, no, I'm sorry. We're going to go through 29. And after 29, we will end. But I do, but I do want to say that um, along with this video, we're going to have, I don't want to say part two, but we're going to have then uh, chapters 30 through 34 that are going to be available simultaneously with this video. Because I am going through this section rather quickly, not because it's not important, but again, the focus is, is here in this section is off of Israel, it's off of God's people, it's just kind of Ezekiel getting into what's going to happen to the other nations. And while there's, there's interesting things there, I, I think definitely... Um, you know, I want to obviously focus more on what is God just doing with his own people. But we're definitely going to, um, you know, you know, at least give a, a, a good presentation on this, just so we get the understanding of why God is judging these nations. So in 29, we read, um, In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Uh, according to Block, this is January 7th, 587. And it concerns the Egyptian kings in the land. And he says um, in verse 3, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of his streams that says, my, my Nile is my own. I made it. I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your streams stick to your scales, and I will draw you up out of the midst of your streams with all the fish of your streams with sticks uh, which stick to your scales, and I will cast you forth into the wilderness you and all the fish of your streams, you shall fall upon the open field and not be gathered and buried. To the beasts of the earth and to the birds of the air, I have given you as food. Then all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord God, because you have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. When they grasped you with the hand, you broke and tore all your shoulders. And when they leaned upon you, you broke and made all their loins to shake. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring a sword upon you and cut off from you man and beast. And the land of Egypt shall be a desolation and a waste. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Because you said the Nile is mine and I made it, therefore, behold, I am against you and against your streams, and I will make the land of Egypt an utter waste and desolation. Okay. And then just skipping ahead to verse 13. He says, For thus says the Lord God, At the end of forty years I will gather the Egyptians from the peoples among whom they were scattered, and I will restore the fortunes of Egypt. Very interesting. And bring them back to the land of uh, Patros, um, the land of their origin, where they shall be a lowly kingdom. It shall be the most lowly of kingdoms, and never again exalt itself among the nations. And I will make them so small that they will never again rule over the nations. And it shall never again be the reliance of the house of Israel, recall, recalling their inequity. When they turn to them for aid, then they will know that I am the Lord God. Okay, just like, I just find this like really fascinating. So like, we, you know, we kind of quickly went through like all these cities that are going to be destroyed and they don't exist to this day, right? Like uh, Moab, Tyre, uh, you know, the Ammonites, these places are going to eat them. But God says, oh, I'll restore Egypt though. So till this very day, in 2021, we have Israel still exists and Egypt still exists. 
It's very interesting. And, and this is, remember, Ezekiel's writing 500 years before Christ. So this is, you know, 2,500 years later, we still have God's people, Israel, um, and or the Jews, and we have the land of Egypt. So I, I find that very interesting. So, okay, this image of like this, this gigantic fish, um, or this di gig gigantic dragon, my, my translation uses, some translations use monster, is like basically like it's describing Pharaoh as like this big monster in the Nile with his tentacles going through all these canals. Because, of course, the Nile is like this, 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 this ri really river of life for them. Okay, but the Lord, what does he do? And th this monster looks scary and, oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? He's controlling the river, this gigantic sea monster. Well... <laughs> The Lord hooks them like a fisherman and flings them out of the river onto, you know, into the wilderness, onto the ground where he dies and he becomes the food of beasts. And he says he did this because Egypt was a staff of reed to Israel. According to Block, the image shows Egypt's futility against the Babylonians and their inability to help Israel. Remember, Israel was entering into all these different treaties trying to protect, um, you know, trying to push back Babylon. Okay, um, but Egypt really was not able to help. They did make an attempt to fight, but they were eventually driven away. So um, they'll be scattered like the Israelites, but they will be restored as well. Okay, so God says Israel will be restored, but they will not possess the grandeur that they once did. Okay, very interesting. And in verse 17 in the 27th year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. And we're talking um, April 26, 571. So this is a much later prophecy. This is years and years later. Even though it's right next to this prophecy, it's years and years later. Um, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made his army labor hard against Tyre. Every head was made bald and every shoulder was rubbed bare. Yet neither he nor his army got anything from Tyre to pay for the labor that he had performed against it. Remember how I said they didn't defeat Tyre? Here's Ezekiel admitting it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall carry off its wealth and despoil it and plunder it, and it shall be the wages for his army, which he will do. I have given him the land of Egypt as his recompense for which he labored because they worked for me, says the Lord God. On that day, and then in verse 21, and I'll talk about this separately, on that day, I will cause a horn to spring forth to the house of Israel, and I will open your lips among them. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Okay, so this is very interesting. So the Lord revealed to Ezekiel that, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had indeed fought against Tyre. Um, however, um, you know, he was not successful. Like I said, Tyre was not destroyed. Now, there are many theories about this prophecy. Black highlights a number of them. A simple... Uh, answer may be, according to Black, that this prophecy may have been conditional. Like, if Tyre doesn't, so to speak, get its act together, it will be destroyed. So maybe there was a conditional element to it. So it, this is a little bit of a mystery, because everything else Ezekiel is saying is, is coming to pass. And even this, you know, like I said, Ezekiel brings this up. It's not like he's hiding it. And God says, okay, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, fought valiantly, but he was not able to take the city, so he's going to go on to Egypt. So again, a lot of theories on this one. But, um, you know, it, it's interesting that the Bible does not try to hide this with this. So maybe it was conditional. Maybe, you know, through further study, scholars will discover that, you know, there was a conditional element to this. And just very interesting, chapter 29 ends with the Lord proclaiming that a horn will spring forth uh, to the house of Israel. Now, the question about this, when I was reading the commentary, is, is this a messianic prophecy? A horn will spring forth. Um, so, Block admits that several, several scholar, biblical scholars do not think this is a messianic prophecy. Um, you know, um, others, of course, do. Block points to Psalm 132.17, which shares similarities. It talks about a, a horn coming from David. And of course, David represents the kingship. So it says this in the psalm. The, the Lord says, there, there, I will make a horn to sprout for David. I prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will close with shame, but upon himself his crown shall, will shed its luster. So when the Lord says, on a day I will cause a horn to spring forth to the house of Israel, I will open uh, your lips among them, then they will know that I am the Lord. Is this a messianic prophecy? Again, it's not 100% clear, 
But one thing I can say that's clear is that there's a lot of messianic prophecies coming. So this wasn't one, although I tend to think it is because of the horn aspect. And you see this uh, with David, the horn sprouting. Um, you know, but the, again, that's, that's uh, you know, maybe not entirely clear. But we have a lot more mess, uh, messianic prophecies coming. So the next class will cover 30 through 34. We're going to finish uh, some of the prophecies against Egypt. And then we're going to get into um, how is a restored Israel going to look? Who will the Messiah be? So let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much uh, for watching this video, and I will see you soon.